says you, we can use your name and send this information out to you on a regular basis. If you don't check that, you're not going to get anything. You will not be on the mail, email list. Uh, if you do check it, then automatically your application will go to a mail, email list and you get the information that you want. So that's basically it. Uh, we're we're uh, starting here pretty soon, and please sign up as soon as you can. a great job for us this year. Um, Dewey Hansen is going to be taking over for him um, next year. Um, okay, so um, Barbara, Barbara Kidd, we have an exhibition. Um, when Betsy comes to do our workshops, we also have an exhibition right then. And so Barbara is going to talk about that and maybe some other things. Maybe, maybe some other things, we'll see. <laughs> All right, I think all of you know that we have a spring exhibition coming. Um, it closed um, a few weeks ago, a week ago, and had a little computer snafu. So if it affected any of you, I apologize. <laughs> kind of shaking. I, I sent out an, an emergency SOS email that was kind of in a panic just to tell people disregard that. So uh, long story short, that has been corrected. Everyone should know the status of their submissions. Um, they should have received an official email, whether or not you were in or out, for each painting. And if you have any worries, concerns about um, whether you're in or out, you can always go to your Art Call account, and right there it will say if your painting's juried in or juried out. If that doesn't work for you, I am happy to answer any of your questions. I have a list of people that were juried in here if you want to ask me in the back. Um, I, you can also send me an email, and I'm happy to check your account for you. Um, <clears throat> so again, I apologize. And I was kind of thinking about this, because when my daughter was um, applying to colleges, I did remember that there was an incident like this at the University of California, San Diego, and they had 28,000 people that were admitted by accident. So <laughs> that was a little bit worse than, than what happened to us. <laughs> so thank you for your patience. Some of you sent me really funny emails, and I appreciate that. Um, Okay, so I think that's it for the spring at the moment. Um, let's see. Um, I think that's all I have to say for spring, isn't it? Yes. No, white mats. Oh, thank you. Yes. Question back there. Oh, about what percentage uh, end up being picked? 38 percent. 38 percent. 38. 38 percent. So that's pretty competitive. Uh, with 171, it was one of our, one of our most. Um, most competitive events. So good job, you got in. Yeah. And, and this is um, a white mat only event, meaning white. White can be a cool white or a warm white, but it is white. I'm sorry, some people have kind of asked me a lot of questions about that and want a different color of cream. If you feel like you're painting, um, won't work for with a white mat. There's, you know, you could save it, I suppose, for the next, um, the next exhibition. But we've had that on the perspective. So it is white mat. If you have any questions, please ask me about that. I think that's the only other thing. Everything else is intake dates. Hmm. Intake dates. Uh, let's see. Hmm. On April 25th, we will have an intake date at the Visual Art Institute. That's 2901 South Highland Drive in Salt Lake. And that's from 4.30 to 7. 
And then on the 29th, that will be up at the Eccles uh, Community Arts Center, and that will be from 1 to 4, and that's on your prospectus. So that's the next thing you'll need to do. And I think, I think that's it. I think so, because I think yeah. that's it. We're talking about small ones. Yeah. And just so you know, on your calendar, we have a busy six months. We have um, spring, small, small works exhibition, two star, and then fall. So you'll have lots of opportunities to show your paintings. Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> Barbara's done such a great job. We all mess up sometimes. And <laughs> all we can do is try to fix it. She's, she's really good. Okay. Um, all right. Let's see. Small works. We'll wait and have Ben Sam talk about that. Um, Roxanne is going to talk about the One Star, Two Star exhibition. Two Star Signature. Two Star Signature. And Signature for those of you who are Signature members. Um, the uh, two star signature show, which we exhibition, which we have every other year, is open to anyone who has two stars or signature status. So it's something to, uh, to uh, strive for. This year, um, the prospectus is going to be coming out at the end of June. And um, the show is going to be September 5th through October 16th at the Utah Cultural Celebration Center. And each artist is allowed to enter two pieces. It is not juried, but it is judged. Meaning that, um, uh, guess what? You don't get a rejection. <laughs> like I was to say, everybody gets in. Because <laughs> everybody gets in. Okay. There's a lot. Yeah. So get painting on that one. Okay. Also, I'm going to um, put on another hat and represent. Uh, Lisa from Cache Valley Chapter, who's not here tonight. This next Tuesday, April 9th, Nancy Maxwell Lunn will be presenting and, um, at the Logan Library at our usual time. 6.30 we have a critique, and then 7 to 8.30 we have presentation. And then Saturday, April 13th, she will be giving a workshop for us from 10.30 to 4.30 in the Logan Library, so that should be really nice. Also, one other show to paint for. This is the summer show in Cache Valley. Again, it is judged, but not jury. So just entering the show, and you get to hang, get us to hang. And we were able, uh, with the help of Brenda Manella, to get, we're going to be hanging it in the Utah Theater, um, and it's going to be hanging there during the opera season. So there's going to be a lot of out-of-town traffic, and it should, you know, it'll be seen by a lot of people, and it's going to be a very, very nice venue. So the, in, the prospectus will be out sometime this month. The intake date is going to be July 8th, and the show is going to run through most of July. I mean, pardon me. Yeah, we'll be hanging it July 8th, and it'll run through most of July. The prospectus isn't out, so I'm pulling things out of my not too great memory here, but roughly that's it. And where can they find this information? It will, the prospectus is gonna be out there this month with all the information for that. So on, one more show you get to paint for. On the website. On the website, <laughs> which is a wonderful website. And anyway, we'll get it out there and uh, thank you. Thank you, Roxanne. She has to drive a long way to get here. Logan. Um, so we had a nice mini workshop with Roland Lee. It was really awesome. Um, Sandy and Lori did a really great job. And he was a fun teacher. Um, okay, so let me come back to that. Nina has some fun stuff going on. She's in charge of paint outs, but we've got a really fun one coming up. Julie, you gotta do something with that light. Oh. Yeah, twist it. it. Twist it towards oh, you. Yeah. What no. is it doing? No, just, you have to have it. Well, I can't see my... Uh, you can't see that. 
I can't see my paper. It's worse. Okay. You have it. If you okay. Have it parallel to your surface, it won't be in their eyes. But you had it bent down. It was in their eyes. Sorry. Thanks for speaking up. Sorry. No. Okay. Well, we have some exciting news. Our paint out on April 13th at uh, the East Riverfront Park Fishing Ponds in South Jordan. It's at 11267 South Riverfront Parkway in South Jordan. In addition to our normal paint out, which anyone can come and participate with no cost, we are also having a uh, quick draw competition that the City of South Jordan Arts Council is sponsoring at $25 per person. There's a link on Facebook, uh, there's a Facebook event for that, that uh, you can register there, or you can register the morning of, and you would want to arrive by 8.30 if you're going to register. What's even more exciting, if you're able to watch TV tomorrow morning, on Fox 13 from at 8 a.m. and again at 8.45 p.m., there, we're going to have a spot where we're going to do a demo and promote this event for us. Fox 13. Fox 13. Big Buddha. Big Buddha. So he's one of their morning show hosts. Uh, anyway, I'll be there. Julie will be there. Kelly Holdman will be there. And then Paige Kimball. Kimball, yeah. And so we're excited about that, and we're excited to be able to promote the Watercolor Society as well as our paint outs and the quick dry event. So, so last month they, um, the paint out was at Gilgal. Gilgal, yes. Gilgal. Uh -huh. Gilgal. And there's a couple of um, paintings that were brought that were started or completed. Well, mine started. Last month. Uh, yeah. Somebody forgot to bring there. <laughs> okay, all right. Thank you. Um, okay, we're going to have Tom talk about scholarships really quick. Camera? Put that on you at the last minute, didn't you? <laughs> oh, we lost it. Oh. Thank you everyone who donated to the scholarship fund and who purchased an opportunity to attend Betsy Dillard Stroud's workshop. And we have a winner. Um, uh, we have Irene Rampton. Irene, are you here? Irene, we'll, we'll let Irene know and um, how exciting she was. She, yeah. Yeah, so the scholarship thing's just something extra we do, just to try and get the youth involved in watercolor, get them interested. And um, okay, yep. arts and the park, Mara. So this year already we have over 20 people signed up. We have room for 30. Uh, that's where we cut it off. And I was looking uh, to see we have a good mix of some returning artists and about half are new to this event. So we really look forward to that. So I had a little uh, get together with a few folks and the rest of you all send emails out, but we have an opportunity uh, one of the uh, homeowners down there is offering up their house. Uh, it's a four bedroom, three and a half bath. So that's perfect uh, for saving money because if you get four or five people to share, it cuts the cost of lodging way down. Um, they'd like to give it to us for free, of course, but uh, they, they're going to turn it into an Airbnb, so they have to uh, have some money for the taxes. Uh, Again, the rules this year, 
Uh, I'll go over them real quick. So in case you're thinking of signing up but you really don't know anything about Arts in the Park because you've never done it before, we broke the competition into two parts. Small paintings, which are a quarter sheet and smaller, down to five by seven. And uh, large format, which is no bigger than a, a half sheet. And that's because we just don't have the space when we do the show and auction. And a half sheet, most of you know, is 15 by 22 or 11 by 30, depending on how you tear your paper. Uh, this year, we'll have uh, the awards for both of those categories, but we're also going to have a best in show, and that, that's in the, uh, the new rules. Um, we also have a new event, and that's Thursday night, so I'll just go over the schedule real quick. Wednesday night is always a fun artist welcome dinner. Uh, Susan Snow, uh, the widow of Doug Snow. Many of you are University of Utah artists, you know about Doug Snow. He had a studio down there for years before he was killed tragically in a, a car accident heading back home. Uh, she hosts a welcome dinner at her house. There's still many uh, really great Doug Snow paintings in her uh, uh, her house and it's fun just to talk with the other artists. It's the first time you see everybody. Uh, you can check in early on Tuesday. You kind of have that time free to yourself, paint on Wednesday. Uh, but the first time we see everybody is that artist welcome dinner. Thursday we have uh, a free day of painting and then Thursday night we're hosted, hosted by another family there in the uh, Tory area right before we go out to Sunset Point for a star party. Our guest artist this year, Susan Jarvis, is married to Seth Jarvis, who runs the planetarium. He's bringing his telescopes and all of his knowledge of the stars and the night sky, Torrey and uh, Capitol Reef. Most of the Colorado Plateau National Parks have been awarded dark sky status a special thing since you don't see it if you live in the city very much. You can't see the Milky Way very well. So that should be really interesting and really fun. Uh, Friday will be kind of our same format where we go out on a gallery stroll. There's only two galleries. In the tour. Uh, but it's still fun because they welcome us. They have all the, uh, the goodies for you. And it's fun to talk to artists who live down there. Uh, and then our guest artist, Susie Jarvis, will be doing a, pre a presentation, and uh, she is going to do it on uh, traveling sketchbooks and books with watercolor, kind of like uh, what Bess Ann is uh, going to show us, I hope, a little bit about what she actually did, but she's been doing this sketchbook thing for years. Uh, it's an important way to journal your experience as an artist and your experiences through life. Um, we also, a lot of you know, but we do a, a kids event in conjunction with that and that's not usually until Saturday. And guess what, it's gonna be on journaling, sketchbook journaling for the kids and we're gonna have them make their own sketchbooks. Uh, Saturday, as always, is a fun auction and show they have music, they have food, the, pe the townspeople from Torrey come out, a lot of the people that have their second homes down there come down from Salt Lake, and it's to see the art, to meet the artists, and buy some of the art. They have supported us, this is our sixth year, uh, they, they really support us down there. It's a, a very friendly, cozy atmosphere. Um, and then on Sunday, all too soon, it'll be our farewell breakfast, and then we get together and say, what can we do better next year? And uh, that's always fun, too. So, anybody interested or have any questions about Arts in the Park, because we're getting down to the last month, uh, if you want a space, you should reserve it now. And if you're interested in it, uh, and you don't want to register yet, but you're thinking about that house and how many people you can bring down with you, uh, call me or email me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mara. It's a fun event. I'm going to get out of my comfort zone and go do it this year. Okay. Um, did I forget anybody's announcements? Oh, well. Small words. Well, yeah, but are you going to announce that like right now yeah. before I uh, yeah. introduce you? Yes. 
Okay. <laughs> so this is still part of the announcements. Um, the mention was made that the Small Works show is coming up in this summer. Um, it's our annual show of paintings that are small. And for those of you who haven't entered shows, it's probably the easiest one to enter. It's, um, you're guaranteed that um, if you follow the rules, everybody gets at least one painting in. You can enter up to two. The show um, is uh, opens July 16th, goes through August 9th. And that sounds so far away, doesn't it? Like, I don't have to bother with that now. But on April 18th, the registration opens. The registration closes on June 1st. You know how May gets. There's graduations, weddings, there's Memorial Day, and then June 1st is there and you didn't do it. So think about something you already have painted that you want to enter and do it in April. Get it out of the way so it's not stressing you out. But for those of you who haven't entered, there's this magic number of 144 square inches. And I wanted to explain what that is because it's not the size of the painting, which is what you'd naturally think. I've had some things up here that disappeared. Okay. Hmm. I, had a, I didn't take it. I had a demonstration on how to measure a frame. Is it in the case in this well, anyway, if you take a frame and you measure the across the top measurement, let's say it's 10 inches, and you measure along the side. Now, this is the outside edge of the frame. 10 inches across, let's say it's 13 inches down. You multiply those two numbers together you get 130 for that frame. If it's less than 144 square inches, it can go in the show. So that's what the 144 square inches is. It's not the size of the image, it's the size of the outside of the frame. And um, you enter it on Art Call, which is a software program all over the Art Call registration, it says, for problems, contact Bessie Ann Swanson. For questions, contact Bessie Ann Swanson. I'm the show chairperson. Please contact me. It's, it, it's a little confusing the first time. Um, if you feel like you don't know how to photograph your image, I can tell you my quick and dirty um, plan of just a point and shoot camera on a sunny day. That's all you need. If you don't know how to resize your image, contact me. I can tell you how or I can do it for you. So it's meant to be an easy, um, an easy show to enter. And for those of you who remember last year's, it was at Red Butte Garden. It sure was fun. There's just a whole lot of little gems that never see the light of day except for this small show. So think about entering. And April 18th, the registration opens. Thank you. Yeah. What about playboard? Is it allowed? <laughs> Have to read the perspective. Yeah. Yeah. I think it is. Yeah. 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 Read your perspectives when you get a chance before you paint. You'll know all the rules. Okay. Is that all the, the announcements? Are there any others before I introduce Bess in? Any shows or anything? Okay, so I'm still looking through my frame. That's that's weird. <laughs> that's weird. Okay, all right. So tonight I'm pleased to um, that we get to hear from our own Bess Ann Swanson. So how many of you realize that Bess Ann is actually a retired physician? She's she's a doctor. So if we have a heart attack or something, <laughs> she's there for us. Um, but she always cr uh, did um, pursue her creative side. Like she minored in art, even though she was a doctor. 
She's really active in our watercolor society. She's served on the board for uh, quite a while, and the last few years she's headed up this uh, journaling class that we have before. And it's free. It's free. So if you want a free class, you just show up before this meeting, and um, she usually teaches it. She did. She got a sub tonight. But um, you have to check it out. Okay, so Best Hand has won honorable mentions in both Arts in the Park and Paint America. Um, I also remember that she recently, I think she won an award and this painting, her painting became the cover of our directory before we had our redneck directory. <laughs> so she was, she was this person and she did this cover. And um, she's also been featured in environmental publications here in Utah. She also has had many solo exhibits, and she's got a website if you want to check out further her work. Um, so tonight we're really excited to have her share her pilgrimage adventure. Five weeks, 500 grueling miles, hiking and sketching her way to the famous Camino to Santiago de Compostela. Is that, is that how you say it? Good job. Okay, anyway, let's all welcome Bess Ann. Thank you, Julie. <laughs> I want to also thank you all for coming. Um, this to the microphone. Oh, th this is kind of an unusual presentation. We don't normally have travel logs. So I thank you for, for getting here tonight. Um, I want to thank my husband for his endless patience in helping me get this PowerPoint together. Um, technology is not my thing. So um, we, we have learned a lot in the last couple weeks. <laughs> So, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Camino de Santiago. Um, I would assume well, we have some people here who have done the Camino besides myself. Um, anybody who's done the Camino, a part of it, or all of it, you want to raise your hands? <laughs> okay, one. No, two, no, two. Two? Who was the other, who was the other one? I missed. Somebody. Okay. Um, so let me kind of define what we're talking about. Um, the Camino de Santiago is an ancient pilgrimage route. It's been traveled for a th over a thousand years uh, continually. Now, the popularity waxes and wanes over the centuries. Um, it crosses northern Spain and to define the terms I'm using, Camino needs, means road. Santiago translates as St. James. So we're talking about St. James the Apostle. You know, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Well, James ended up preaching in Galicia, which is northwestern Spain. And um, so you're following the route of St. James when you follow the Camino. There are many pilgrimage routes around the world of different um, lengths. And what makes this one unusual and uh, uh, popular is the fact that you walk it. You don't drive it. Um, you can actually do it by bike or horse or foot. That's your choices. And um, so for some reason, it just attracts a lot of people from around the world for, who do it for many different reasons. Popularly known as the way. Uh, so instead of saying Camino de Santiago, people in the know, they say the way. And there's a popular movie out that stars Martin Sheen that's called The Way, which people have all over the world have seen that movie. Pilgrims that I ran into from whatever country would say, Martin Sheen, Martin Sheen. <laughs> he was kind of up there with Santiago. <laughs> so, um, so I did take my sketchbook. Um, we walked every day. Um, and uh, let me get oriented here. Can you help? Ah, I'm, 
good. So this is where I'm talking about um, this is sensitive, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It is. Okay. Nope. Back another one. The the pale uh, the pale yellow is Spain. Um, Portugal Portugal is on the left coast. Mm -hmm. It's it's the map is in German. I apologize. Um, France is up there. So kind of get your orientation to Europe. The red line that's going through northern Spain. That is the uh, Camino Trail that we took. The, all the rest of the lines on that map are actually also Camino de Santiago. The people come from all over Europe to get to the end of this route. Um, where we started was actually just over the line in France. And it is probably the oldest part of the Camino. Um, it has the most accommodations along the way. And it is still the most popular for tourists to start there and go almost to the Atlantic Ocean. The Cathedral of Santiago is, I have it up there in the, in the left upper corner is the, the blue um, cathedral. And it's not on the coast. I just wanted to point out it's, it's about 55 miles inland. So we started in France, crossed the Pyrenees, went through a few towns in Spain that you might have heard of, like Pamplona, um, Burgos, and Lyon are the biggest cities. But most of the time, we're traveling through rural, ancient towns. It was not unusual to stay in 16th century lodgings. And this is not a camping trip. We basically stay in hostels along the way. We made no reservations, so every day we would stop when we were tired, we'd find a place to stay. We started in the town of Saint-Jean, Pied de Port, and that's in France, and that was my very bad French. Um, Pied de Port means something like foot of the port. Um, it, I expected this place where hundreds of pilgrims arrived daily to start. I expected it to be a city, and it was really an old medieval town, and that we were all new to this. So people register themselves um, in an office on, in this town that you are an official pilgrim, and then you go look for a place to stay, and there are just doors along the streets, cobblestone streets. You know, next to the door is a, a sign uh, announcing that they take in pilgrims. And you walk in and ask them if they have a bed and how much would it cost? And it's always bunk beds. Um, and I think the thing that most people have heard about on the Camino is, is living in dorm rooms. It, it at times becomes a little stressful to sleep with 30 other people in the room. <laughs> so um, I'm saying we, and I haven't introduced, I did this with my daughter, Ellie. Um, there's the two of us. Um, Ellie's in the back. We may be able to uh, get her up here for some questions maybe at the end. Um, behind us is a, actually a highway sign that says um, Santiago de Compostela. That's it, that's where we're going. 790 kilometers. That translates as 500 miles. Um, a lot of my pictures are taken in the dark because we started about 6 a.m. every morning. We were up before dawn, partly because it was hot in the middle of the day and we wanted to get going. Speaking of dark skies in Capital Reef, uh, Spain has very dark skies because they don't have many street lights. So when we would get up in the morning and get out on the trail with our um, flashlights, they were beautiful. It was just beautiful. The stars were out. The Camino heads straight west. It doesn't vary much. So on our left, the constellation Orion was always up in the sky. On our right, the Big Dipper was always uh, just above the horizon. And I felt like they were our companions along the way as we 
as we walked. Um, so when you go on this, you're trying to find your way. And sometimes the Camino is a paved road, and sometimes it's um, a dirt farm track, and sometimes it's a trail. It's always, always rocky. You, Spain doesn't have any soft dirt. <laughs> it's, uh, one of the, well, one of the problems is definitely your feet. So in the dark or whatever time of day, you're trying to find these markers that tell you where the Camino is. And they really are well marked. The only problem is that you're often distracted and not paying attention. But the, the blue and yellow symbol there, that's a, kind of an abstract of a seashell. The scallop shell is the, the symbol of the Camino. And it's on many of the markers. Probably the more common mark, though, is the yellow arrow because you can paint that anywhere. A rock, a, a, on a sidewalk, you can put that yellow arrow. The right lower quadrant photo is the yellow arrow on a guardrail. <laughs> and frequently when you were in a city, they would have markers for the Camino um, embedded in the sidewalk, and that's the, the lower middle picture was a, a marker telling you um, which way to walk through the city. On your head. Uh, well, uh, no. <laughs> the question was, on your hands? Uh, they were just being creative. So this is an example of where we stayed in Spain. The word is albergue. In Fran France, it's the same word pronounced alberge. Um, sometimes the rooms had five bunk beds. Sometimes they had 20 bunk beds. First come, first serve, who, who gets the top bunk, who gets the bottom bunk? Um, people of all ages, they were not segregated according to men and women, everyone just mixed in. They were provided a mattress, a pillow, and usually a pillowcase, but we all carried um, either a sleeping bag or a sleeping bag liner. Um, they weren't always heated very well at night, needed a little bit of a cover. The outside of an albergue was always decorated with laundry. <laughs> you, do, you do your wash by hand, but really, you only have about two or three articles a day to wash, so that makes sense. You put them out in the sun, you hope they dry overnight. If they don't, you hang them on the back of your pack and, uh, and carry them for the next day, trying to get them dry. Spain was pretty dry, I was surprised. Um, I, I think of Utah as being extraordinarily dry, but Spain wasn't very different. So this is my version of what I carried with me. So I had a, a backpack. It was, it was smaller than um, what you would call a backpack, um, somewhere between a day pack and a, a full-size backpack. So these are items I took. I didn't add in toiletries, and I didn't add in art supplies. There is a guidebook there shown. If you, uh, if you want to know what the right upper corner is, it's my faithful jar of Vaseline <laughs> that was my skincare. But that's, that's the change of clothes, that's the warm weather, that's the rain gear, that's the uh, utensils for eating, that's the change of clothes, that's it. And our packs were about 15 pounds. We were traveling as light as we could. This was not a heavy, heavy pack at all. We started in the Pyrenees, and um, the Pyrenees aren't really uh, sharp and, and high altitude, but they are they're kind of rounded mountains, grazed by uh, sheep and cows. Notice in that sketch that I do have black pen line. I'm going to be talking about black pen line a lot because I'm kind of enamored of it. There's black pen line on that, but it doesn't. That's not a. That's not a sketch that needs a lot of it. And you'll see some some other sketches really do, kind of need it for def definition, but. 
If you've got good values of light and dark, you don't need to define it as well with the pen. This is the first place we stayed in Spain, and it was an ancient monastery. They'd been hosting pilgrims for 500 years there. And it was at, they actually had a modern albergue, uh, although there were, I think, 90 people uh, on a floor. They had three floors of pilgrims. Were they full? Were they full? Yes. Wow. Yes, they were full by about 5 p.m. <laughs> yes. Another reason to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning. We, we saw every dawn. You had to walk backwards to see. Well, we did turn around. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, I think we only saw one, maybe two sunsets because we were in bed by then. <laughs> in Albergue, where we stayed, I wasn't thrilled with the architectural style I went out, what we would do is we'd, we'd get to our destination at one or two in the afternoon and the first thing you wanted to do was to get in your bunk bed and put your feet up and not walk anywhere for ever and again in your life. <laughs> and people would catch up on their cell phones and they would sleep and um, read their Kindles. And after about an hour of that, I couldn't stand it in, anymore, and I'd go out and um, sketch. That was my sketching time. I didn't want to walk, though. So what I needed was a place really close and shade. And that's uh, all I, oh, and a place to sit. I was not going to stand and sketch. I started here in the courtyard in front of our albergue. Um, and I was actually sketching the right building that has it just barely shows on the corner some windows with flower pots on them. And um, Ellie came out and joined me, and I was grumbling about the architectural style of our albergue. And so she um, sat down and challenged me to sketch the albergue in 10 minutes. And she joined me in, in trying to do that, um, and she is the only time I've ever seen her sketch. And so this is the page that came from that. The left upper corner of the page is the original windows with the plants in front of them. And then the albergue um, with the laundry, of course. And I added in some other things we'd seen during the day. Some people say that the, the pro predominant religion on the Camino is foot care. <laughs> this photo is probably the iconic image of the, um, of the Camino. Um, it, it's actually a sheet metal sculpture, and it was put up in the 90s, so it's, it's very modern. There are actually in total 12 figures in this sculpture. The, the first couple are, I didn't get in the photo. Um, but it begins with, with one pilgrim alone, like the first few that went along the, uh, um, along the path. And then a few more, and, and then what you're seeing is the horseback people are the merchants who came to um, provide for the needs of the pilgrims, had to start um, providing places to stay and places to eat, and then you get, the figure that's in front of me is, I, he has a, like a tri-corner hat on, so I'm thinking 17th century, something like that. The figures behind me are actually modern pilgrims. Um, and they have uh, sun hats on and backpacks on. And, and it's not clear from this photo, but, but um, they are the modern ones because of the popularity of the uh, Camino in the late 20th century into this century. If, if you think the architecture looks a lot like Italy, this is Roman architecture. Those Romans got around. 
The wine fountain gets a lot of press. So along the Camino, outside, there is a fountain that if you pull the faucet, out comes red wine. There's no fee, no one's guarding it except Santiago there, the statue looks over the wine fountain. There's no limit on how much you can take, although they do say um, uh, you should drink it there and not carry it, which means you don't fill up jugs, I guess. Um, what, you see, what you see me doing is I'm trying to fill the cap of my water bottle because my water bottle is full of water and I'm not giving it up. And I didn't have anything else to put wine in. So I, got, I filled up my cap and I got my sip so I could say I had wine from the wine fountain. just lie down underneath the um, wine is so prevalent from Spain. You always get wine with dinner. Even on a cheap dinner, you get wine with dinner. Um, and when, sometimes you order, when you have dinner and they just, you know, there's two of us at dinner and they bring us a bottle of wine and I'm thinking, I don't want a bottle. And so we have some. And then as we leave, they pick up the bottle and they put it on the next table. You know? <laughs> they get the bottle. <coughs> Not quite the same as here. And we did stop at a wine tasting and that was very elegant. We had our glass of wine and then we continued on our way. Um, sketching um, a church steeple when I couldn't see the church. Uh, I was actually a street above the church. I was not gonna walk to go see the church. So I sketch the steeple and, and look at that one and how important the line is on that. You know, the watercolor really is pretty pastel and doesn't really define things. So that's an example of, of how important um, pen line can be. Um, this is more about pen work than watercolor. Uh, again, another example of only could when I could only sketch the steeple because the church was wrapped in a uh, construction fence. So that is what I could see above the fence. So here's Ellie modeling uh, as a peregrina. In Spain, the word for pilgrim is peregrino. She is a peregrina. And I like the word because the root is shared by peregrine falcon. And we are, we are wanderers just like they are wanderers. So I like the word. She has her headlamp on from the early morning. So that way, with the flashlight strapped on your head, you have your hands free for hiking poles. The guidebook in her left hand, which is permanently in her hand, <laughs> and her coat, which is on backwards, so that she could take it off or on without removing her pack. And this was kind of how we looked every morning, <laughs> in including the fact that we didn't comb our hair or you know, uh, really take care of ourselves till the first cafe stop. Another place we stayed and um, what I liked about this sketch was that I made it yellow instead of the usual beige. <laughs> like, I'm tired of beige. What color can I make it? And of course, check out the laundry. This is how you have breakfast in Spain. So when we'd get up early, we'd um, we get up in a dark bedroom. You don't turn on the light or everyone will be very upset with you. You um, throw your things in your pack and you uh, sneak out of the bedroom, boots are left at the front door, and you're out of there within 10 minutes. So in a couple hours of hiking, we're very hungry and we try to find a cafe. By that time, they're opening. And our ideal breakfast was to have a tortilla, and that's what I'm eating there. It's actually a Spanish omelet, and it's uh, eggs and potatoes. Sometimes they had other flavors in it, but it was always eggs and potatoes. It was served cold most of the time, and it was delicious. 
But when it was served hot, oh my gosh, it was heavenly. I don't know if we were just so hungry, but that was like the best food I have ever tasted. We tried, tried to get that every morning. So for that tortilla, and there's some fresh tomatoes, I have a baguette in my hand, and my cup of tea, that would be about um, 250. Um, very inexpensive to, to be on the Camino um, in Spain. So if we can't find a cafe, the other photo is we um, flop down on the Camino to rest our feet and we eat out of our packs. And um, we tried to have yogurt with us. That was the one thing we, we um, seemed to work the best. Sometimes crackers, sometimes fruit or nuts. And sometimes just a pretty sketch. And, and I really got tired of church steeples. <laughs> Sunflowers. Most of the fields we passed by were harvested grain. But the, uh, we did pass vineyards, and um, I guess it was just the sunflower fields. They were past their bloom by the time we were there, but uh, their heads were still hanging heavy, and they were just uh, lovely. And that's, that's my sketch of the sunflower fields. This is one of my favorite albergues where we stayed. It, um, it was originally built as a church and a hospital for pilgrims. Pilgrims in the ancient days made the pilgrimage often to be cured of something, um, to have their sins forgiven. Um, so hospitals sprang up along the way to take care of pilgrims. This was built in the 14th century. And what was a common ailment at that time throughout Europe was ergotism. It's a disease that is caused by a fungus on the rice, on, on the rye grain. So um, people who live in rye eating areas would come down with ergotism. And it was a disease that affected the circulation of your extremities, compromised the circulation of your extremities so that you'd get sores on your uh, hands and feet that would then turn gangrenous and you would die. Coincidentally, if you started to increase your activity level so that your circulation was going <clears throat> faster, it would fight off the ergotism. So if you started if you had ergotism and you started on a pilgrimage early enough in the disease, you actually were cured of ergotism. <laughs> so that was one of the popular times of the Camino. Um, and also, these people would have left behind their rye heating areas. So what is left of this, the hospital is gone, the church walls are there. You can see minimally, the roof is gone. The photo of it, um, down on that wall, there's like a half roof that's coming forward, and there's some doors under it. That's actually an albergue that they built against an ancient wall. This is the building codes of Spain. <laughs> and we went there deliberately because um, we we read in the guidebook that there was no electricity, and we thought, well, that would be quaint. Um, you couldn't, of course, charge your cell phone or any of your equipment, so most people did not stop there. Not only did we not have electricity, but that affected the showers. We did not have hot showers either. But it was a delightfully um, cozy place. Only four of us stayed there that night. And we were hosted by um, this is Magda, uh, an Italian volunteer. Most of the albergues ha were staffed by volunteers who had done the Camino themselves and came back to give back to the Camino. And they would volunteer to be cook and bottle washer and cleaner for anywhere from two weeks to a whole season. And she was there for the season, and this was a pretty out-of-the-way place. We had dinner outside at a picnic table at dusk, 
and we had breakfast by candlelight. The, so the back wall of that is actually the ancient church wall that the uh, albergue was built against. Um, Azofra wasn't a terribly interesting town, but um, I did this sketch and I wanted to show you how you need darks in the sketch to make it work. So you look at the photo and you see how nice, how much nicer those shadows are compared to the one I did. Um, I, when you have a middle value sketch, and I have a lot of them, I have a hard time getting the dark down, a middle value sketch, black line helps, helps a whole lot to kind of pull it together and give it definition. Well, another morning we're walking along, and this is Maria at her table. And before Maria had this table, her mother had this table. And she told us that she is out there every morning um, from March through November, from sunup to sundown, to greet the pilgrims. And she had a name for her table. It was called Figs, Water, and Love. <laughs> and we miss the fig season, so we just got water and love. <laughs> um, so, um, so we heard that in the next town we were approaching, that there was a, uh, a famous painting by a famous artist. And it's in the cathedral. And that's, that's what we knew. <laughs> so the town was called Lagroño, and it's like a small city in Spain. So we walked into town, we saw the cathedral. It's, it's now 7.30 in the morning. And you know what's the chances of seeing a famous painting in, the, in a cathedral at that hour? But we went and found a side door open, went in, there were no lights on. It was a very dark church. Um, there was no one else there. there were, it was big enough that there were side altars all the way up to the front, and then the front altar. And all the side altars had paintings in them. There, were, there had to be 100 paintings in that cathedral. And we didn't know what we were looking for. So we said, OK, you take that side, and I'll take this side, and we'll meet up front. So we're trying to, with our little flashlights, see something that, we sh that should jump out at us. I got to the front and I said, and we met up and I said, let's go. We're not going to find anything here. And, and Ellie said, well, I went by one that said it was by Michelle Angel. <coughs> and I said, okay, well, let's go look at that. It was an, an area that I had passed by because it was a lot of sheet metal boxes. and. So I thought it was probably the electrical switches for the cathedral. It was very modern looking. These. So we went back there and realized that that was part of the safe that was guarding this painting um, by Michelangelo. <laughs> um, now, when we went up to it, of course, it was too dark to see it. But there was this little box underneath. It says, put in your 50 cents. And the, the light will come on for one minute. <laughs> so we got our cameras ready, we put in our 50 cents. And the Quadro del Calvario, that means the square of Calvary. And um, I, I don't know much about it, I don't know when he painted it. It was only about 12 inches high, it was a, a small painting. Um, so, wait a minute. So talking about religion along the Camino, um, I went as a Catholic pilgrim, expecting to see lots of Catholic pilgrims, and I probably saw less than five. Um, it is definitely not a route uh, that is common for Catholics. They say that 70% 70 70 of the people on the Camino say that they do not believe in God. Yeah, so why are they there? Yeah. 
one thing in common everybody had is that they were, I, I think, I'm a little, I'm interpreting them, I think they're looking for something. Um, some people um, had quit jobs, were looking, what do I do next? Some were retirees, um, enjoying life. Um, for every pilgrim, there was a different reason of why you were there. In, in any of the towns that was large enough to support a church, they would have a pilgrim mass at 8 p.m. every evening. So you could count on that. And um, after the mass, the priest would invite up all the pilgrims to come and get a blessing. And the, the priests in these churches, I think they were professional Camino priests because they, they were so appreciative. They thanked us for doing the Camino. They gave us a little pep talk about what a wonderful thing we were doing. They gave us a blessing. They were just a kind of like so encouraging. Um, and, and everybody went to the pilgrim masses, whether they were Catholic or not. And it was, uh, it was kind of another thing that we, we joined together. Reli religions, they are just, they all blend together. I went back, didn't I? Um, while I was on the Camino, a friend of mine contacted me that uh, her mom has been diagnosed with brain cancer and asked me to pray for her. So here I'm lighting a candle in a little chapel um, in prayer for her mom. But I think religion and art actually erupt spontaneously along the Camino. Uh, there is so much expression of, of art along the way with, by people who don't have any materials. So like this is a chain link fence that's decorated with crosses made out of sticks and bark and ribbons and poems and there's photos of someone dear to them. There's messages. It's really moving to see this and it takes all kinds of forms of people um, just expressing themselves. We were walking through a small town um, that, you know, the kind of street where it's all stone buildings and they're all connected and there's just a door and a door and a door. And one of the doors said, for peace and love, come inside. And we said, should we? <laughs> and so we opened the door and went in and the whole first floor of this place was set up for pilgrims to rest. And there were comfortable chairs, it was shady, um, there was um, uh, what you, quotes on the wall from important people about peace and love. They had lots of reading material, like it, what I saw in English was um, you know, Mother Teresa, uh, Krishnamurti, Oh, Mary Oliver. I thought Mary Oliver's poem, poetry was there. I thought that was interesting. Um, but all languages, and you walked out into the back and there was a beautiful garden with a lot of handmade art, you know, driftwood um, sculptures. The path was made of mosaics. And, and candles were burning in, in this place, so we were like, there's no people here. and There's candles burning. It seemed that they lived on the, the upper floors and they just left the first floor for pilgrims to stop and, and take a break. The, um, this is the scallop sh uh, shell of the Camino next to a Tibetan prayer flag. It's, it's all together. Passing by a shop window, these, win these words were in the window. Um, Creer, crecer, and crear. Creer means to believe. Crecer means to grow. Crear means to create. So you have believe, grow, and create. I thought about that for maybe a whole day because I couldn't decide if they were in the right order. 
And I wondered, for all of our lives, we have to decide what order they are, they should be in, or they are in, or they've been in. But I thought it was something interesting to think about. What gives life to the next step? I, I don't know. Another of my favorite albergues in a town called Granyon, which was not much, but there was a big church in town, and we knew from the guidebook that the albergue was in the church. So we circled around and found this door with a sign on it that says albergue on it. We walked in, and inside the door is a spiral staircase that's wide enough for one person, and there's nothing else. You just walk in, and there's a spiral staircase. And we, so we started going up, and we started to doubt whether we were in the right place because it just kept going. I suspect it was actually maybe for a bell ringer. Like, why would you have a spiral staircase? It goes up and up and up. But anyway, about the fifth floor, I'm guessing, it opens out into a kitchen and like a living space. And then one floor up from that was the albergue where you slept. And that's the photo on the right. That's where we slept, under the slanted church uh, roof. And they provided the mats, and you just claim your mat. That's where you slept. The bathroom was downstairs. Um, <laughs> no, not, not five floors down, one. And then this was the kitchen. And at dinner time, they, not, not all the albergues served dinner, but if you were like in an out of the way place where there weren't a lot of cafes, they would offer dinner. And they, they asked for um, volunteers to cook dinner. Here's the groceries, here's the menu, go for it. Um, this is for 40 people. I, I don't do things like that, so I, I wash dishes that night. But I was so impressed by the Spanish kitchens because they were four burner stove, there was a sink. There may have been a refrigerator, I'm not sure. No dishwasher. They never used microwaves that I saw. And they served up a dinner for 40 people. And they do this every day of the year. That's what they do. That's the capacity of their albergue is 40. It's a very impressive. Another church. While I was sketching this, um, a man came and, and sat next to me, and he wanted to watch me sketch. And I actually offered him my sketchbook and my palette, but he didn't want that. He, he was Korean, his name is Kim, and there were a lot of Koreans on the Camino, and I don't know what kind of, um, why it's popular in Korea, but very, uh, we didn't meet any of them who could really communicate with other pilgrims, uh, not English, not French, and not Spanish, which are the main languages on the Camino. But I have to say about all the Koreans we met, they were the friendliest and the most welcoming people I have ever met. What a lesson in body language. They were smiling, they were shaking your hand, they were um, always just made it look like you were their long lost friend. So he came and sat down with me and I, I, I thought he might want to paint, but he didn't. And so I proceeded to do my sketch. And you notice that he's sitting on my left and the palette's on my right. So every time I dipped my brush into the palette, he would lean forward to look around and see what I was doing. And then as I came back and put it on the sketchbook, he thumbs up. <laughs> like I'd made the perfect choice. <laughs> and he, of course, I was charmed. <laughs> I, I don't get audiences like that. Um, so uh, he was, he sat there for over an hour with me with every, every stroke of the brush he wanted to see. Um, so I thought maybe I could just stop and show you what I did take for art materials. Um, 
And I guess I'll bring them up here. Well, I don't have a microphone, so I'll just do it here. Okay. So this is, um, I, I don't have much to show you because weight, it's all about weight. I'm not carrying weight. So this is a very cheap plastic palette from, uh, I think, uh, I got it from Utrecht. Um, it costs less than $10 and you put your own paint in it. And it doesn't even have a brand name. Um, but it's very lightweight. I have other plastic palettes that are actually sturdy and good that are heavy. And this is lightweight. Um, wherever I go, I always stuff my pockets with napkins after eating, you know, any <laughs> napkin you can use. So this is this, this place for your blotter on it. And I didn't, I didn't even bother cleaning it for tonight. It's just, it is what it is. And then I take, I have a flat brush, a round travel brush, and a little detail brush. And, and those are the brushes. I take a pencil, but I'm not allowed an eraser. Because if I took an eraser, I'd spend all my time erasing. So, and then I take a black pen, and I don't really have a love for any specific brand. I use about a 0.7 millimeter black pen. And I used to always start by drawing with a black pen, and I'm changing my style because, like a good kindergartner, if I put down that pen line, I stay within the lines. And so I'm really starting to think, do the watercolor first, and then if it needs black pen, and it may not need black pen, you can add that. If it's too stiff, you can kind of put wiggles in. Um, if it's crooked, you can kind of straighten it. Um, so that's my current strategy. I'm, I'm kind of, fascinated just by how much black pen can make a difference. And I do want to say with a black pen, don't make a straight line, a long straight line, because if it's crooked, it's a, it's a long crooked line. You, what I do when I have a, you know, a long edge, it break the line, just do, you know, do a, a piece of it, and then a piece of it, and a piece of it. If one of them's crooked, nobody will notice. So that's how you get away with trying not to make crooked lines. You know how people say, oh, I can never be an artist. I can't draw a straight line. <laughs> I always think that's so funny. I can't either. <laughs> um, this is my water container. And the, I think I got this at Hobby Lobby. They come with lids, but I don't see a point to that. It's meant to clip onto your sketchbook. I can't imagine keeping this clipped on my sketchbook. All I'd have to do was sneeze, and it would, it would dump all over. I, or the wind comes up. Or, so I never clip it on my sketchbook. I just put it beside me. And then a sketchbook. This one is a Stillman and Burn sketchbook. Um, I understand Utrecht just started to carry them. Uh, I'm not going to tell you that it's the most wonderful sketchbook in the world. I'm still looking for the most wonderful sketchbook. Um, it, it, it has some really nice features, though. One is that it's soft bound, so again, it's lightweight. It will open flat, so you can, you can paint all the way across your page if you want. Um, and you can paint on both sides of the page. It doesn't, it doesn't go through. So. That's nice. So, you know, I, I like it. By the way, mark your sketchbooks. Put your name in it. Put your contact information in it. First thing, if you misplace it, which some of us tend to be rather scatterbrained, especially when you're traveling, then if someone finds it, they can, if they want to get it back to you, they at least can make an effort to do that. How many sketchbooks are, lo are in lost and found? Um, and also mark the front of it. Have you ever gone to an art workshop where everyone has a black sketchbook and everyone's walking around saying, is that one mine? I, I put mine down over here somewhere. Ma make it yours. Now this one is uh, stickers up from the Camino. It doesn't even have to be themed. 
just put some pretty stickers on it. Or you can be a whole lot more artistic than I. And I take a little, um, this is a spray bottle that used to be hairspray. And um, it, by the way, if, if you get this, or I understand there's hand sanitizers that spray, right. and I understand they make good water bottles. If you do the hairspray deal, when it's new, before you use it, dump out the hairspray. <laughs> because once you spray that, it will gum up the works of the sprayer. But they come with pretty good sprayers, probably because hairspray does gum up the sprayer. Okay, that's what, that's what I took for art materials. Um, sometimes you just can't find anything you like to paint. There's an expression, I think I heard it on Facebook. Be sure to have a brush in your hand when inspiration strikes. So the idea is just get out there and sketch, even if you're totally uninspired. I do, I, I do, I should say something about, whenever I finish a sketch, I'm always disappointed in it. I always think, well, tomorrow will be a better day. But if I put that sketchbook away the next day or later, and I look at that sketch I did later on, it looks a whole lot better. It just got better. <laughs> and I think it's because I'm no longer looking at the real object. I've forgotten what the real object looked like. And nobody else who sees your sketchbook will ever know what you messed up. <laughs> so. Um, when you're on the Camino, you have to prove that you did it. So you collect stamps. And everywhere you go, you get a stamp and it's dated. Um, you can see there one from Granyon, the one I, I showed you was the spiral staircase place. On the left side, three down, is the figs, water, and love table of Maria. <laughs> So you can get your stamp at your albergue, at any churches along the way, at cafes, at roadside tables. Um, but they're really fun. These are stamps. These wow. are stamps. So. We kind of overdid the stamps. After a while we said, okay, enough. Um, Ellie was looking through my slides and she said, I'm missing people here. So I threw in a slide of people. Um, Angel with the watermelon, he gave us a free slice of watermelon with our beer. <laughs> I, I don't actually like watermelon, but it was the best tasting watermelon I've ever had. It was, it was wonderful. At one of the albergues we stayed, the nuns in the bottom picture uh, <coughs> sang songs and had a kind of a sing-along of songs from different countries where pilgrims were from. And the three men on the bench are just scenic Spain. I'm just gonna show some sketches here. Tell us about your walking shoes and your feet. I'm sorry, what? Tell us about your walking shoes and how you took care of your feet. Well, um, I, I, this is a, um, a talking about feet and shoes and what did we do. Um, I wore light hikers, which means they're low hikers. An awful lot of people wore trail runners. That was probably um, more common. I, I read something about Spain that talked, northern Spain that talked about their granitic soil. And I thought, yeah, I know that granitic soil. It's nothing but granite rocks sticking up through the dirt. Um, so we aver averaged 15 miles a day that we walked. Um, and so by the end of the day, the bottoms of your feet just felt like hamburger. They're just so sore. I took extra insoles, you know, ex 
expensive ones. I paid a lot of money for those insoles, and they did help, but you still felt the rocks coming through. Um, blisters, of course, are very common, and um, tendonitis was very common from just constant walking your ankles, get tendonitis. So we had a lot of issues, and they tell you along, uh, at the, when you start the Camino to stop and rest your feet every hour. Everybody is so anxious to go. We stopped uh, maybe every two hours um, just to rest our feet, take off your boots, air, uh, air out your feet, put them back on and keep going. We did hit um, uh, blackberry, right blackberry season. And that was really, really nice, like free food along the road. And when you get to a cathedral and you just can't deal with the ornateness of it, uh, make it simple. This is a cemetery. One of the reasons that you're missing people is that I don't like to sketch them. They don't stand still. <laughs> so this is my first one that I put people in. And they are, they are on the Camino. So um, there's, there's I, I, I have to get over my fear of people. And this, this is Ellie modeling being a, a peregrina again. The Cruz de Ferro is an important stop along the Camino. People prepare for it before they leave home. And, and the reason for that is the Cruz de Ferro is where you leave behind something of yourself. Um, Maybe it's just your mark on the world, or maybe it's your sins. Maybe it's your bad habit that you're letting go of, you're leaving it behind. There's different interpretations of, of what you're doing at the Cruz de Ferro, but, so the sketch, well, um, so picture of Ellie, she brought a rock from the shore of the Green River in Utah, which is a, a special place for her. Um, the sketch shows the Cruz, the, the Cruz de Ferro, sorry, means cross of iron. And that kind of gives you some perspective. Um, along the, the lower part of the pole is like a lot of streamers, and that is just ribbons and, what were people using, string and whatever. They were just tying on anything that people's stones and, what they brought to leave behind. And uh, so that's a, it's a very special place. And from 790 kilometers, we're down to 65. <laughs> and we didn't often cross highways, so we weren't aware of just how close we were to Santiago. We were like, Oh, so 65 kilometers is like 38 miles. That's like three days. Like, wow, this is going to end. <laughs> um, so Ellie's celebrating. Yes. There are so many wise sayings along the Camino. Someone should publish a book of wise sayings that we came across. This one, don't forget. You were always on the way. And, and that's, and we always will be on the way. And that's true for all of us. And there's some more people. Um, at this point, this town was called Melide, and I think probably we were in the outskirts of Santiago um, because it was much more urban and uh, modern than where we had been coming from. Melide is known for its octopus. We didn't have any. <laughs> <laughs> but we did have the most delicious vegetarian meal I have ever had. It was fabulous. And onward, 
that says Santiago de Compostela. Compostela is the town or even the area that Santiago is in, and Compostela means land of the stars. We're at the cathedral. Um, the cathedral was originally built in the uh, 11th century, and it, every era has to add on more ornate, different architectural style. It goes on for blocks, and it is just ornate on top of ornate, uh, quite overwhelming in its size. Santiago is a fairly large city in uh, northwest Spain. And there, there we are in front of the Camino. And uh, that's the front door of the Camino. And that was uh, quite the feeling of being, of we've made it, and the feeling of what do we do now? <laughs> we really hadn't thought ahead. Bess, and what gave you the idea to do this trip? We had seen the movie The Way many years ago. It's probably 10 years old. It's a very uh, enjoyable movie if you haven't seen it. And always said, we'll do that someday. When you graduate from college, when I retire, when da, 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 uh, my husband always said, I'm not doing that. So <laughs> it was always Ellie and I talking about it. And I don't know, last spring I just thought, I'll put this off forever. Yeah, yeah. I just need to do it. And Ellie works seasonal work, so she's, uh, and I'm retired, so um, we just fit it in between one of her jobs. And uh, we were both very enthusiastic about, let's do it. And, and this, I have to give credit here to Jeannie Millicam, who um, is a sketching artist and teacher, and one of the things I learned from her is, <coughs> If you're overwhelmed by the buildings, just do the skyline. And I really, really like that because I get overwhelmed. So that's the cathedral. I want to explain the circle in the right upper corner. Um, that, it, that's carved in stone and it is inside the exit door of the cathedral. So as you're leaving, it's above the door. And it has on it the Alpha and Omega, the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. Alpha is first and Omega is last. But they put Omega first and Alpha last. And the message is, your Camino is completed, but now you start the rest of your life. So that's the message. So that's the presentation, but I hope we have questions. How long did you spend on each painting? Oh, how long? Did, oh, how long on average were you painting? An, an hour. I'd actually give myself a deadline. Yeah. Yes. What did you do for a camera? Um, I used my phone. <laughs> and, and actually, I'm really a camera devoted person, but I didn't want to carry it, <laughs> and I don't love my. <laughs> I, I found it is really limited in dim light, um, not not as. But anyway, what month did you go? What oh, I'm sorry. Month? We went. We started September sixth, and we finished October 9th. Oh wow! Um, so it was fall, but it was it was above eighty degrees through um, all the month of September. Okay. Yeah. Yes. How many pigments did you take? How many pigments? Yeah. You know, I have to, true confessions, you can tell why I, uh, my paintings often look so pale. I never had to refill these wells. I should have needed to refill the wells. You know, 35 days of painting, so it tells you I don't use enough paint. But, um, oh, 15. Um, I use an awful lot of Quinn uh, burnt orange and ultramarine blue, They're, uh, and red, and like, the others are kind of optional. You didn't run out of those ones either? What's that? You didn't run out of ultramarine blue? 
No. I actually took three extra tubes of paint, one red, one yellow, one blue. I thought if I ran out, at least I'd have three primaries and I never used them. How many paintings did you do today? You know, I don't know. How many paintings did, did I do? <laughs> a day. Oh, a day, just one. Just one. Yeah. Was that during your rest? Or yes, your rest while I was resting. Because you said they were always in a hurry to go, and I was just trying to figure out. Yeah, I, I actually never, um, while we were hiking during the day, I never stopped. Yeah. Um, so. so more evening. Well, late afternoon. There was no evening. There was late afternoon. You had Bedtime. dinner, and you went to bed. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it is. So, 6th September to 9th October. Uh -huh. That's more than 30 days. 34. 34 days. Mm -hmm. You should get one of Brian Mark Taylor's Strata easels for that, the, the 31 day Strata challenge. Oh, really? Yeah. I don't even know about that. <laughs> <laughs> there, there is a. Every January, people do this oh. 31 day challenge. They do a painting a day. You do a painting a day for 31 days, yeah. and you win an easel? E well, you get to apply. Oh, you get to apply. And somebody wins. <laughs> okay. Yeah, her circumstances. I, that's what. That's what I'm saying. With what you went through, you should get it. <laughs> Thank you for your vote of confidence. I'll tell Brian. Down the street from me. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. You want to hear about losing things on the Camino? <laughs> You know, um, you, you take so little, and then when you lose something, you're like, oh no, I lost it. And everybody lost things. You didn't even know, how, how did I lose that? How, how did I miss that? But there's a saying on the Camino that if you, if you don't, what is it? If you, if you don't have it, you don't need it. And then there's the corollary to that, that if you need it, you will find it. <laughs> so you put those two together, and there's a real rotation of things along the Camino that find owners, <laughs> leave their owners, and honestly, sometimes it seems pretty magical. Like, really? I just found that? <laughs> That's just what I need? Oh. Everybody is going from France to Spain. Do any of you go the other direction? Um, it's a good question. Um, a very few. And they are the people who are walking home. Oh. Um, but, you know, it's a funny thing to have a hike only go one direction. So if you're lost, you just go where everybody else is going. Um, but in, in the old days, they would walk to um, Santiago. And to prove that they had done the Camino and completed it, they would continue on to the Atlantic Ocean, pick up a seashell, and take it home. That's right. And that's where the seashell comes as the symbol of the Camino. And what's the little thingy on the seashell? The little oh, that? It's called the Tau Cross, T-A-U. It's a Roman name. And uh, it's, it actually, it's an old cross from St. Anthony of the Desert, and that's about all I know about it. Yeah. So uh, then Helen. Did you fly after you got there? You flew home? We flew home. So I guess at the airport, they've always busy with one way traffic. Well, but yes, yes, it is. They must have a lot <coughs> more planes leaving than yeah. arriving. Yeah. Helen, is St. James uh, commemorated anywhere along the way? or All along. There are stat I could I could do a whole program on statues of St. James. He's portrayed as anything from uh, like a musketeer <laughs> to an apostle. <laughs> Some of them are like, boy, that doesn't look that doesn't look. What's that? Was was he a healer? Not that I know of. No. What's the language problem? Are you fluent in Spanish? Um I I have basic Spanish. My daughter is actually more fluent. And um, as far as pilgrims go, uh, English is very commonly spoken. As far as the locals go, they're used to dealing with non-English speakers. 
But it, you know, it was always nicer when you could speak to them in Spanish. But um, most most of the pilgrims did not speak Spanish. So. Yes. Do you have any good recommendations for sketchbook type lessons besides yourself, which I know you're doing? For sketchbooking? Yeah. I have a wonderful internet resource for you. There's a place called sketchbookschool.com, and school is spelled S-K-O-O-L, so sketchbookschool.com, and they do like three-minute lessons. It's really fun, and they'll do, you can do like daily lessons. Um, some of them, a lot of them are free. They do sell courses, but um, you can get hundreds of free lessons through them. Other than that, Susie Jarvis, who's the person doing the Capitol Reef, um, the re artist in residence for the Capitol Reef program, she actually does monthly, like a once a month sketching class. She calls it journaling. Journaling, yeah. Um, and the name? Susie Susan Jarvis. Susan Jarvis. Susan and I'm sure she has a web page. And I'm sure there's others, but I don't know. Yes, but do, um, for those of you who are interested, there's a sketching class here from 6.30 to 7 that you're welcome to come anytime and join us. All right, well, thank you for your attention. and beautiful and I knew it would be fabulous. Watch for us on the news in the morning. <laughs>
bishop or was somebody who ended up inviting you. Uh, he was also a South Korean's on the city council. Yeah. And South Korea at that time was a city state. Sure, it was part of the Habsburg Empire. They kind of ran their own thing. They had for centuries, for millennia. Um, anyway, so he's running, he's running supplies behind enemy lines to these guys. And eventually they realized that they're trapped and the Turks are going to overrun them. And he figured out how and got them through the lines and uh, away. Saved them all. So in 1686, he wanted to marry this guy, and she was Irishman, and he wasn't. Although the Hintel family goes back to the late 20th century. Uh, so the family was the time of the civil crests in the late 20th century. This guy, yeah, this is my mom. But uh, this guy, he was in time, and although he was a merchant, he was pretty much in the market. So he went to Kaiser Lake, who, uh, by the way, was the one at the time who uh, was the one who uh, you see in the front of the